What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special Saturday, October 12th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Week Stand Up. Man, Stu, it's been an absolutely long week. We appreciate everybody checking out our weekly recap, but whoo, man, long week. Long week. And thank goodness, as of the time we record this intro, nobody has dropped any bombs in Israel or, or Iran. So we like yeah. that. If, if absolutely at the, you know, but Hey, the, the weekend is a, is another story folks. So we will keep you updated <laughs> on all that. A lot of great stories, guys. This team goes in and is going to pick some of the top stories from the week. So you'll get some of the best stuff that you heard on the podcast. I got nothing else to do. So we're going to go ahead and kick this off as always, guys, all this stuff brought to you by the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job trying to keep that website up to speed. Uh, go hit the description below links to the timestamps, links to the articles. Um, you can also check us out on Substack, and you also can hit and go to invest in oil.energynewsbeat.com. If you are interested in our direct working interest project, it's tax season folk. I can't stress this enough. If, if you are a high net worth individual and you are paying taxes, we have the solution for you. Invest in oil.energynewsbeat.com. The best way to mitigate your taxes, diversify your portfolio, and gain a little bit of monthly income is from investing directly in oil projects. And we have the hookup, guys. Invest in oil.energynewsbeat.com. But I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to the team. We'll see you on Monday, folks. What will happen to oil prices if Israel attacks Iran oil installations? I wrote this when I getting ready for tomorrow's Energy Realities podcast with David Blackman, Irina Slav, and Tammy Nemeth, and we're going to be talking about oil prices around the world. And if Israel were to attack Iran's oil installations, the immediate impact on oil prices would likely be a significant increase. Really? But there's different layers. I didn't really even think about half of this until going through the research on this. Small scale attack, only 5%. Major refinery or export terminal. There's one island, Michael, it's I believe the Car Carga Island has 95% of their export. But if they actually did the downstream, that would have a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. I did not know, Michael, that Pakistan is a gray market where they smuggle in gasoline from Iran. <laughs> I did not know that one. So when you take a look at this, this is really bad. But Michael, Josh Young, I absolutely recommend everybody follow Josh Young. When you take a look at what sanctions matter if they're imposed and done correctly. Look at the amount of Iran-linked violence in the Middle East has spiraled out of control. Do you want to know why we got here? Take a look at this one chart, Trump versus Biden on the impact of oil field sanctions and the implementation. But let's also look at Ananias here real quick. Dr. Ananias is just wonderful. Recommend him as well, too. During the Biden administration, not only U.S. crude exports hit record, but Iran's hit export big time. Now, here's the key thing. Dan Salt on Twitter. I love this one. He has a big red circle around the troubled spots. It's the Middle East. And he goes, bang. That is an analysis that I can deal with. Who knows what's going to happen, Michael? I don't know how it's going to turn out. If Israel strikes and does a death blow on this, I think it's going to help. The only person that's going to help is Russia. Everything yeah. else is a failure. Again, I think what I like about this article is it kind of breaks it down into kind of multiple different scenarios. You've got the small scale attack, which is, you know, if if it's limited to a potential small portion of wherever their Iranian oil output is, you could see somewhere of a, a five to 10 percent increase because, you know, that number probably will be about 10 to 20 percent of Iranian oil production. It takes offline. Right. If that's escalated into, a, as you said, an export terminal, this is where you could see that oil price increase past one hundred dollars a barrel specifically on both the WTI and the Brent oil price. Right. You know, Carg Island has the majority of their oil refining capacity and you could see somewhere between 30 to 50 percent. You know, I mean, if it's if it's a full scale attack, I mean, you're, you're going to see anywhere between 120, probably yeah. and 150 dollars a barrel, which 
would absolutely be devastating to the economy, not just exactly. here in the United States, but also abroad. It'll be interesting to see where you know Israel goes. I mean, they're really fighting a war on seven fronts, so you can't necessarily blame them for having this opinion. I would be interested to see, though, specifically with the U.S. providing a lot of advice to them, what they decide to do in response to all of this escalation. I mean, you know, the, the one word to describe all of this, Stu, spicy. Uh, spicy. And and the one thing that I've, I'm getting a lot of ridicule from, from commenting on folks on Twitter or X, excuse me, X, if you can imagine that, is China. Everybody's saying that they put too much weight on China's demand and its impact on oil. I don't think that that's a false number because they're buying everything they possibly can anyway. And that's what happens when countries go to war. And they are worried about the geopolitical front. So they're bu- they're going to buy everything they can get anyway. Tariffs backfire as China outmovers rivals with global EV investments. Do you remember when you and I were laughing and the Chinese wanted to in- interview us over the, was it the tankers in the bay? That we went from a Putin advisor to a Xi advisor. Yeah, so uh, Absolutely. Um. China is investing heavily in electric vehicle assembly plants, battery plants, and transition technologies. They are really outmaneuvering everybody on this. Hungary is a beneficiary of what the Financial Times reported as a tsunami of transition investments around the world. Central European country is often at odds with the central EU government in Brussels. And they should be. The Chinese invested abroad roughly 12% increase, unbelievable, or $112 billion over the first eight months of this year. They're printing money and going after the EV market. They really are. And I think they see an opportunity with the extreme high cost of you know domestic made EVs. They see they have a chance to go ahead and make small ones. Now, both Trump and Biden have mentioned the tariffs that they're going to levy on China in an, in an attempt to even the playing field. But but really, I think what gets hurt in this scenario is, one, a product that's not differentiated. It's one of the reasons why I think Tesla will win, even if they are more expensive, is because they've differentiated themselves from the market by having full self-driving, by having you know basically a completely new concept for a vehicle. I mean, you get into a Tesla, you feel like you've walked into a spaceship relative to some of these other cars. Whereas, and and, and so there, you always what really gets hurts that middle market brand. You know the the you know the Ford EV. We've talked ad nauseum about how much they lose per vehicle. Well, they're going to get pounded because there's no differentiation. And if the only right. differentiating factor of your car is that it's electric, well, you're going to lose to a gas-powered vehicle every single time, at least today, because of the efficiency of it. So I think it's extremely – it's in everyone's favor to either continue to make luxury EVs and make them as novel as possible and find what your niche is. Tesla's figured it out with the self-driving, but then also figure out, okay – We are probably then going to have these really low cost options from China because they've gone out and sourced all of the mirror. I mean, because the biggest input into all of these cars from a cost standpoint is the sourcing of the raw minerals and metals that goes into this. And China has done a great job of going out and getting all of those mines under its control. You bet. Hey, shout out to Irina Slav for Oil Price. That's where we uh, got this article from. She is a fabulous authoress. Yes. Historic short squeeze sends oil prices higher. In this story, they're talking about when funds were the most short on oil on record, the broader energy space was the most sold sector. Goldman U.S. Prime Book, the, driven by U.S. short sales, were outpaced by long buys for 6.4 to 1. And here we say was the hint to the next mega squeeze as the recent short selling in energy was the largest in over five years. That's pretty nuts. When you take a look at over the last five years of short selling, they're really betting on it. Reza Delmangi mostly trades equities, but for the past week, he's been dipping in and out of the oil market, lured by the crude's biggest weekly rally in nearly two years. Quote, ever since we reached 67, it's been going up quite steadily and orderly, said Delgamani, I believe. I apologize for pronouncing your name wrong. A Phoenix-based day trader who's been trying to capitalize on the market short-term decision. When it's orderly, it's great. 
I'll tell you what, I'm really kind of nervous about the whole thing, though. And there's a lot of great information in here. The, the bottom line with record shorts now painfully squeezed as upward momentum has ignited across the energy sector. And with a flashing red line that, Riz that Israel has leveled Karg Island and looming and unwind what a week ago, a record short position in oil and energy stocks is just getting started buckle up and well if you've got the nerve or the stomach go make some money serbia's parliament debates a ban on lithium mining this is huge serbian parliament began debating on opposition a proposal of ban lithium and bore mining and exploration which effectively put an end to contested uh, rio trento project in the west of the country I agree there is a time and a place. There's never been a greater danger for Serbia. Nothing will stop without lithium. There will be no apocalypse and no austerity. The ruling coalition said it will not look back. The opposition proposal has a comfortable majority of 156 deputies in the 250-seat parliament. Parliament will vote on the proposal in the coming days pending the end of the debate. I have mixed emotions. Mining is something that you do need. Energy security needs to be done as much as you can within your own country. However, there is a lot of discussion on lithium mining in the United States and whether or not there are companies that are going to take advantage and destroy land or make a land grab over mines. If that is the case, mining is not a good thing. And I don't know that the energy transition is actually in the best possible light in order to do them. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this turns out in Serbia's parliament. We'll be following it and with that. From our good friend Robert Bryce, the DOE is stonewalling on residential energy costs and it's electrify everything push. And it's pretty, pretty crazy here. So basically what this article goes on to say, one is that they're rolling out a bunch of new rules on you know, go forward electrification. They just, the EPA and the Department of Energy just released the new deficit net definition of zero emission buildings. And what that basically means is that the buildings need to be free of on-site emissions from energy use. And I love this little quote here from the article. It doesn't take a mechanical engineer to understand that the definition precludes using a boiler or furnace that burns hydrocarbons. You know, the agency did push back a little bit and said that this is not a regulatory standard, but they, they do go on to note, however, that eight major green building facility certifications have been agreed and that they, quote, embed or align the exceeded the zero emission definition uh, within their certification. Basically, what that means is that the DOA has adopted this definition that really isn't a regulation, but will basically force companies and force people to use those green, use that non-regulation as a regulation. It's another, you know, example of Stu always likes to talk about legislation you let through regulation. I think this chart's really interesting. Miss Producer, if you don't mind throwing this up, electrify everything. Who pays? This is according to the DOE, the energy equivalent residential energy cost from August 2023. Natural gas is the lowest at $14. Heating oil is the second lowest at $28. Propane at 33 kerosene's at 34 and electricity is at 46 dollars this is obviously on a per mm btu basis and basically what he goes on to say here is that they haven't released the 2024 numbers and you, you know, 2020 you know basically going back all the way to 2011 these were released sometime in march and april Last year was the first time it wasn't published until August, and we just saw that little chart here. It doesn't look good for electricity, and basically they haven't released it this year. It's October 8th, and they haven't heard anything. It's pretty unbelievable. They keep saying, oh, it's imminent, it's imminent, it's imminent. And and basically the, the assumption that Robert's saying here that I agree with is, you know, th they don't want to release this because... It's not going to look good. Electrifying everything is going to cost more. It's going to be driving costs up. And we're in an election. So they don't necessarily want to make the vice president, Kamala Harris, look worse than it already is. And this is, I love this here. The unfortunate punchline here is obvious. The DOE has 
politicized its legally required reporting requirements. It refuses to publish the residential energy price data because the numbers will be embarrassing for the DOE and the Biden administration. At the very moment, Vice President Harris is vying to be the next president. And I, lo I love that he always ends with this. I may be mistaken about this, but until the DOE proves me wrong, I will remain convinced that the agency is stonewalling. And you know what? They're probably right. OK, he's got nothing there. This is from our buddy over there, David Blackman, on his sub stack. British oil giant continues efforts to adjust its business plan to make itself more competitive with peer companies. Translation, they need to keep up with Texas and Chevron and Exxon. They they miss the boat. Elimination of the targeted production cuts allows for a series of moves earlier in 2024. I think what they did is they actually also said peak oil is not going to happen in their big BP output. This is a follow along to that, to no one's real surprise reaction to BP's latest move from the anti-fossil fuel activist community was swift and aggressive. The Guardian quotes, Greenpeace UK senior climate manager Philip Evans is saying, quote, this is yet further proof we cannot leave the future of our planet in the hands of fossil fuel bosses. It's clear that BP CEO Murray Ackenskloss has hell-bent on prioritizing company profits and shareholder wealth above all else as extreme floods and wildfires rack up billions of dollars in damages, destroying homes and lives all over the world. Oil companies cannot be trusted to curtail their further destruction of the planet, unquote. What I find hilarious is that these are the same guys that do the BP energy outlook. And basically every year it's doom and gloom for oil and gas. Yet the CEO of the same company, this guy, Murray Atchison, used to be the CFO, is paying all of the bills for this oil outlook report. And they don't follow a darn sentence of it, which I find just hilarious. If it goes to show you, you know, what you say over here isn't necessarily what you do over here. It's unbelievable. I mean, again, as the title said, no real surprise, especially where oil prices are relative to where BP's acreage is. I mean, they talk about getting back in, into the Gulf of Mexico. They talk about diving in with BPX and maybe right. getting a little bit more into the Permian. I mean, of course, why would you not? So it just, it cracks me up. That, and they just sold know. off a bunch of stuff of their wind assets and stuff, and they're bailing out of renewable energy to go back to their core. Yeah. I mean, they obviously they still have about 10 U.S. onshore wind operations through its subsidiary BP Wind Energy. He also did, you know, this, this Murray Auction Close also did go ahead and say they're looking at acquiring the remaining 50% of that joint venture they have that's called Light Source BP. So they're not, it's not an outright abandonment. Obviously, they're in the UK. They can't quite abandon it. You kind of got to keep yourselves as an arm. You kind of got to keep yourself at least an arm's reach away from it. So you can always pull it in and say, oh, no, we got a little bit. Oh, we got a little right. bit. Yeah, but we're also going to spend a billion dollars in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're going to go buy a couple million dollars worth of Permian stuff. So it's just, it, it's funny. But hey, I give him, I give them credit for, for, you know, what is it? The Star Wars quote, you do what must be done. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And and I'll tell you what, they they learn from Exxon and Chevron. And, and, and that is, they got to give back to the money and, and their shareholders. And the UK is going to force them out of the UK. Just watch what happens. Well, we'll welcome with open arms here.